Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, so this video that's playing right now, it's these guys. Um, they're, they're these, I don't know, hackers, video gamers that um, are playing Team Fortress 2. And they're under the map outside the enemy's base. And they're just building turrets there. So as soon as the enemy spawns, uh, they get blasted with rockets, as you see. And uh, one little great little quote from this video is the guy's like, what, what the F are you doing? And they're like, well, I mean, like, pff, if Valve didn't want us to do it, they wouldn't have put it in the game. And uh, that's how I feel about a lot of things. Anyways, I think the video is pretty funny. But uh, whatever. So I'm Fuzzy Knop. This talk is red teaming back and forth, back and fifth, five ever. So uh, sometimes I play a drinking game with this talk. And uh, it normally backfires horribly, and I get way too drunk about halfway through the talk, and then you know I pass out on the floor. Um, I'm gonna try and just play with myself. I, the bartenders were nice enough to pour me a nice glass of not water, and um, if I say four instead of five, and I should always say five, uh, feel free to call me out on it, uh, but don't do it too much. Be gentle. So, a quick survey: who's uh, who's red team here? Red teamers, who, who breaks things? Who breaks things on accident? Oh, good. Uh, who's blue team? Defending defenders, code auditors that don't break things but have to clean up things that people break, network admins, all, all part of the blue side. Uh, anyone on drunk team? You better not be, dude. It's, it's pretty early. Um, I bet people were on drunk team last night, though, right? Yeah. So, outline. Part one of the talk, going to talk about red versus blue a little bit, what that means to me. Uh, penetration tests, why they suck sometimes. I have a philosophical anecdote that may or may not make sense. And then I'll talk about some 360 no scope YOLO swag. And then in part two, uh, a bit of a show and tell. Um, I have a 12 step process, and there'll be demos. Uh, all of my demos, by the way, are going to run through my phone, which is tethered. And uh, I have like one bar right now, so <laughs> we'll see how that one works. And then there's going to be heavies too. Kill you with bare hands. See, isn't he cute? Mm. So, bad, bad pen testing. The pen is tested, and yeah, there's some kerning issues there, but whatever. Uh, worst case, pen worked fine. We checked your checkbox. Pen tested. Great. Uh, hopefully, this isn't you because it's frustrating. And hopefully, you're not the one that has to do this. Hopefully, you're on the, on the receiving end of this. It's, it's frustrating. If you've ever been on a pen test like this, what happens is you roll in and your hands are tied. You don't really get to do anything. You, you know you could probably like hack them. You know you could probably get in a different way, but it's not in scope. So what are some ways that you can find that you're, you're not really in scope? If your users, if you're the user base is out of scope, well, you're missing a big part of the attack surface there. And if you, don't, if you don't really demonstrate impact, if you're just reporting on things that you have found, then how do you know? Like, What happens is you get that pen test back as the receiver of it. You get that pen test back, and you get the report, and you're like, no, this one doesn't apply to us. Yeah, that vulnerability is there, but is it exploitable? No. So not so good. And if you can't validate the findings, also bad. So what about? What about no results? What if you, anyone, so of people who have pen tested or received pen tests, you ever have a pen test with no results? What, what did you do about it? Was there anything you could do about it? So I think there should never be a pen test with no results. Because if you're getting no results, your scope is too tight. You should talk them into widening the scope. Because if, if your scope's too tight and you're getting no results, they're paying for something, and you're not illuminating this path that could have happened, right? You're not illuminating the fish that, that's gonna happen. You're not illuminating any of that stuff for them. And they're, you know, pen testing, checking tech boxes. And I think they do this mainly because of a fear of acknowledging those security flaws, right? It's easier to not have to deal with them, but they need to get the pen test anyways, so. I think we, we know when that happens. Here's my, here's my philosophical anecdote. Uh, writer, uh, economist, philosopher, 
Nassim Nicholas Taleb wrote this book called The Black Swan. And basically what the black swan effect is, excuse me, what the black swan effect is, is this event totally random and after it happens, you overvalue the likelihood of that happening again and it changes and has a huge impact and changes things significantly. So like, he has a problem with this word random though too. Because randomness, people are like, yes, randomness, dice. Throw the dice, one of six sides, it's random. Well, no, it's not. It's going to land on one of six sides. If the dice had a million sides, is that random? No. A billion? No. Random is throwing the dice, and this projector grows legs, and then eats that piece of dice, and then spits it back out, and the dice lands on potato. That was random. The dice is potato now, and it sweetens my coffee. None of that stuff is in the scope of a dice roll. And suddenly, it happened. So what would happen if that happened? Suddenly, we'd be afraid of potato dice. All the time, we'd be like, oh, crap. Don't touch the dice. You know, get your body scanned. P patch heart bleed. Patch shell shocker. This is everything that's going to happen. Now, we do need to, to worry about these things happening, but we need to be careful that we don't overvalue them. So, another guy, Umberto Eco. Umberto Eco is an Italian philosopher, and he has an extremely large library, about 30,000 books, I think. And this 30,000 book library gets visitors. People visit his, his estate, and they say, wow, Dr. Umberto Eco, you probably say it in Spanish or Italian or something. And they say, you have such a large library. How many books have you read? And so he classifies people into two types. The dumb ones that ask that, and the other people. Because it's not about how many books you've read. If you have a library of 30,000 books, is your goal to sit down every day and try and read as many of them as possible? No, it's about curating your library, illuminating the things that you don't know. The things that are in the library, the books that you haven't read there. Those are far more valuable. Because the books you have read, you know what's in them, you know that knowledge now, but the books that you haven't read might have something really important that you don't know yet. So this kind of pertains to, to pen testing a little bit, right? Because it's the vulnerability that you don't know about yet. It's the vulnerability book that you haven't read. So I think it's about illuminating the unknown, and I think the value of things that you do know far outweighs the value of things you do not. So that's how I approach red teaming. Did that make sense? No? I didn't think so either. <laughs> but that makes sense. So let's talk about the red team 360 no scope YOLO swag. And what I mean by this is, this is how I felt going from a consulting pen tester into a role where I'm red teaming all the time. And suddenly like scope out the window. And the goals are different. You're trying to now simulate threat actors. Instead of trying to, to sweep the network, find the vulnerabilities, you're, you're just playing bad guy. And for me, I was floored. It's like crazy. It's the best thing ever. And yeah, scopes anything. Now, you're also testing defenses. Hang on. You're also testing defenses because as you're in a network, as you're red teaming, there should be some defense in place. And that is something that you want to get feedback on. Right? We'll talk about that more later. Here's my 12 steps to red recovery. Have I said four yet? Oh, crap. I mean five. Darn, it gets me every time. So here's scenario scope. Now I started off, I'm like, OK, what's the goals when you're doing red teaming? And I came up with, like, yeah, hack everything. Uh, cause damage, compromise intellectual property, right? And I'm like, I gave the talk once and the slide was like that. And I'm like, you know, that, that's kind of wrong. Those, those goals are, yeah, that's the scope. But, but really, what's the purpose? What are the actual goals? The actual goals are to be a change catalyst for your target. Because somebody somewhere needs the funding, somebody somewhere needs the new budget, and you're going to help them either realize that security is a big issue or help them help someone else realize that. 
And then, you know, leverage, right? In the, within the business, within the organization, they, they need that leverage, same thing. And then like for yourself, looking like a badass, right? Because you want to come out and hack everything and you want to have the results and you want to feel good about it. Now, a couple of restrictions. No denial of service, no getting caught when you don't want to, and no actual physical violence. Uh, a guy on my team ends up uh, always, like, he's like, we'll just kidnap him, we'll cut off his hand, we'll mail it to his family. That's how we'll get the domain admin password. <laughs> well, uh, maybe. Well, let's, let's see. No, no physical violence. I mean it. So what's step one? Recon. It's, step one is always recon. You, you always have to recon your target. And what do I mean by this? I, do I mean like scope them out on the internet? Yes. But I think you should also give them a call. See who answers the phone when you call them. See if anybody answers the phone. I had a problem recently where I couldn't get a hold of anybody at the company because they were all so busy. That's a problem. I had to create a scenario in which I'm important enough that they're going to call me back. So, you know, if you're always worrying that your phone's going to ring and you need to answer it and pretend to be a different person, it makes for a stressful few days. Anyways, uh, you can stop by 5A Visit. Stroll in. See if you can walk right in the front door. See if it's a place that lets everybody walk right in through the front door. If not, maybe you can schedule an appointment there. Maybe you can find a way that they'll let you in. And then your normal OSINT stuff, of course. A big part of this scoping is identifying moments of opportunity. And this is things like if the company has an event going on, something outdoor where people are going to be at publicly accessible, that's, that's a way in. If a company has recent press articles that say things about them, you can leverage that information to create a sense of mm, familiarity for them, right? Slightly established, slightly established trust because of something that's happening and you're talking to them about that. Uh, when companies get acquired, it's great. Everyone's super confused. Um, things are getting integrated. New people are showing up all the time. Great opportunity. Benefit enrollment periods for some reason always work. Where it's like, hey, your new healthcare provider is at this link. I need you to go and register. And I also, you need to use this companion app and download, I mean, like, it's, people will do anything to keep their benefits. Weird, they want healthcare, <laughs> whatever. So, what's step two? After you've scoped your target, after you've figured out what kind of computers they have, after you've figured out this kind of stuff, you have to roll some malware for them. Do you fire up Metasploit and, like, pump out a module? Maybe, if it's the right target environment. If they don't have, like, great detection, if they don't have SIGs that are going to SIG on Metasploit stuff, if you're capable of getting something that's going to bypass things in their network, totally. I, uh, I've been targeting a lot of networks where it's like startup, everyone's on Wi-Fi, there is no corporate network, everyone has a MacBook. So I decided to roll my own malware. And I wanted it to, I wanted it to be flexible. I wanted them to be like, oh, we're going to block that IP, win. And then I want to just be able to move it easily. Um, so I ended up going to the cloud using Amazon. But I also wanted it to be portable, so I used Python. <laughs> so it ended up not portable at all, but whatever. Uh, and I wanted the ability to troll, and we'll talk about that later also. So simple's good because I'm lazy. I don't know how you feel about that. Maybe you're lazy too. So here's what I did. I made something that runs on their box, uses Python, drops SSH keys, goes out to Twitter, grabs a tweet from a Twitter handle, decodes that into an IP address, and then sends a reverse SSH tunnel up to Amazon Web Server, wherever that IP address resolves to. Then what I do is I SSH into that server as well, and that reverse tunnel allows me to SSH directly into the box using the private key and public key pair that I've dropped on the box. Super simple. Here's some benefits. All my traffic's encrypted. SSH to Amazon doesn't look super Suspicious. Um, detection teams end up having a pretty hard time with this, which I was glad about. So here's what the Twitter account looks like. Let's um, let's go for a demo. Oh God. Let's go five a demo. Thank you, sir. I could use a drink. 
here's my steps to giving a good talk. Try to get one demo to work. So what I have is a script that writes another script. Because, like I said, I'm lazy. I'd rather run a script and then get my output every time and not have to like go in and edit code because I'm going to mess it up. Oh my god. If I die on stage, I want to be buried under the stage. So here's, it's an ugly script. I think I need to write a script to write this script because it's starting to get pretty ugly and when I want to make changes, it's just bleh. So here's what running this script looks like. So, uh, good man. All right. <laughs> and that's my demo. Thank you. So here's my snail maker, and in here there's a Python script called snail maker. Creative, isn't it? Um, I call it snail, I, I honestly don't know why, it's not an acronym. Uh, I like adventure time, and I like finding the snail, so I thought blue team might like trying to find my snail, so that's why it's called that. So I have a lexicon. This lexicon is basically a dump of words. I took something from the I, I actually don't even remember where I took it from. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> hey, guys, knock it off. And an XOR key. What would you guys like to use as the XOR key? Five? All right. We'll make, we'll make five fives. <laughs> right. So the username I'm connecting into my server with is called snail, I think. And the Twitter handle is f once in your life. By the way, you can add once for once in your life, damn it, five once in your life, to the end of anything and make it funny. Like, I hope my demo works five once in my life. Kind of like that. Oh my god, this is... Bread team says, or something IDK. And what these are uh, is tweet delimiters. So I just tack these words onto the front and end of the tweets from the Twitter account. At first, I was like scraping the, the website Twitter and just like finding the tags that matter to me and then just grabbing the tweet from out of there. That worked for like a week until they updated the site and the markup changed. So I'll just use my own delimiters. And uh, these are customizable, of course. OSX persistence? Why not? Mm. Now, the way the OSX persistence works is there's something called a launch daemon. And this launch daemon has a utility called launch CTL. And you can write a plist file and then tell it to load. And the plist file basically like determines how it should load. So should it run all the time? Yes, it should run all the time. At startup, yes. So what will happen is the operating system will keep my Python script running until you unload this module. And if you don't know to look for it, kind of hard to find. You see the weird process, you see the Python script, you kill it, fine, I get a new shell in a second. So pretty neat persistence, maybe. Uh. So obfuscation. I'll show you what this ends up doing. While it does it, because this second layer takes takes a bit to run. So here's what the script, when it comes out, looks like. If you see here, I didn't want there to be any strings. So what I'm doing is I have my XOR encoded lexicon, which is like base64 XOR, and then I just tack on all the letters and numbers at the end so that I have everything that I need to form any string that I want. And the script will generate this automatically as it gets compiled. And what will happen is I'll just take indexes into the string that's gibberish and encoded, and then I'll construct my strings using that string. That way I have this, and right now you're saying, look at those variable names, that's pretty obvious. It comes down here, and here's my, here's my running commands to like drop SSH and such. 
Round one of obfuscation gets rid of those stupid, stupid variable names. But you can still kind of see what's going on. This is pretty easy to debug. You just put print statements after everything. It's a Python script after all. So round three does this. Ew. This isn't that hard. Base64 encoded Lambda that can pack, packs everything together. All the functions get decoded in time and run. Mm, half of the targets that I've come up against have been able to decode this, which is good because there's some trollability to be had when it, once they do, once they figure it out. And I think our, I think our malware is done. Then it prints me out some nice stuff, gives me MD5s, tells me all the stuff that I typed in because I've literally already forgot it, and the script is made. I'm going to wait to demo the script because I'm going to demo some other stuff at the same time. Okay. So here's what tweets come out looking like. Red team says, provide Pelican Pi, built, transform, massive, configuring, your, continue, or something, I don't know. Uh, depending on the lexicon you use, sometimes they come out really funny. Sometimes not so much. So step three, be like, I got in. And how do you get in? Well, you have to normally fish someone. That, it almost always comes down to that for me, either that or physically showing up. Um, Here's a nice example. Show up, be there to interview them about their office because it's beautiful. You want to go around, you want to see everything that they have, you want to take pictures, you want to learn about their culture, you want to learn how often employees come into the office at, late at night because it might be useful to know that. You get to see all the computers that they have. And then you've been taking photos, so you're like, oh, hey, um, I have a photo consent form for you to sign. Uh, I didn't print it. I'm really sorry. I'm stupid. But could you please print this for me? And they'll be like, yeah. And then you hand the drive to them, and they plug it into their computer. And then you're like, oh, I don't really remember where I put it on the drive. Do you, do you mind? Great. Thanks. Double-click malware. Double-click PDF. Yeah, there you go. Works every time. 60% of the time. So a couple other pretexts that I really like. Being like, I'm in IT, you have a problem, I'm here to fix it. Classic. Or I'm from a company that you deal with, so you kind of already know us. A good one. Or I want a job and I'm so awesome that you want to hire me so bad that you'll let me come to your office to interview or you'll accept any type of jar file based demo that I've created because you want to see the cool stuff that I've done. Or I want to interview you like we talked about. Or I'm your friend. Now, you can, if the company uses Google Hangouts for their communication, which a lot of them are starting to do now, you can create whatever at Gmail and then guess the company, guess someone in the company's email, which is normally pretty easy. It's like first.last or, you know, first name, first name dot last name. And if you get that right, Google Plus will pop up and you'll be able to see the, the person's picture and what their name is on it. And then you can go to their profile and you can literally copy everything into your profile, their photo, where they went to school, and any information they have there, plus their name. And then what you can do is you can just message someone in the company. And what happens is they'll at first, if the setting is enabled, get a thing that's like, do you want this is blah, blah, blah. But your email looks like their personal Gmail account. And they're like, yeah, I know that guy, of course. They click accept, and then you're talking to them, and then when you talk to them, they don't even see the email that you've used. All they see is the picture and the name. So this works until you're talking to someone and they're standing right next to them, literally. Ouch. One time I was talking to people, and I'm like, hey, I'm IT, I need you to run this. And they're like, okay, of course. And then right as they're clicking it, I go, is this a security test? And I'm like, no, of course not. And they're like, okay, they're always testing us. And I'm like, yeah, they, they do that. Thanks for your shell. Thanks, five, your shell. Thanks, I was getting thirsty up here. Oh, that's a, that's a strong one. Okay, I think it's about time for the collective demos. 
Wish me luck. Bye. <laughs> yeah, now you guys are getting it. Good resolution here. It's going to be fun. Okay, so this one's already timed out. Good luck for me. Five me. This is hard enough, okay? This this cell phone stuff is going to is going to be bad. Okay, here we go. Obviously, I've given this talk more than once. And our password is five fives. Now, the way I drop this is usually with a jar. And I have another script to wrap this up into a jar and drop it and execute. No, it's five fives. Can you count? One, two, three, five. OK, so here's my server. It's listening. It's all like, hey, I'm, I'm ready. It doesn't care about me. It's just a server. It doesn't know better. So I should be able to SSH back into this box. Great. It works. Yay! It's over my cell phone. Come on. I didn't think that was going to work. So here I am on the server, or on my box. Uh -huh. Do we, OK, I'm going to demo what I'm going to talk about next, just in case uh, this connection dies. So there's something that you can do, right? Everybody, what is the easiest way to get someone's password? Ask them for it. Great. Ask them five it. Great. <laughs> so I have another script. What this does is generates, it's a script that writes a script. You seen a theme here? It's a script that generates OsaScript commands. OsaScript is AppleScript, uh, interpreter for the command line. It will run AppleScript. What you interpreter for the five the command line? You guys are getting better at this. What it will do is it can tell any any application on the system to display anything or interact with the GUI in basically any way. So what I do is make a pop-up box. Here's what this looks like. So I'm going to pick an application on my system. I thought my phone was ringing for a second. Uh, let's see. Let's pick something that's going to be on our target for sure. How about five sure? How about you guys have any preferences? How about system preferences? Someone yell out what we want to ask. Five their password. Now, in reality, what I would do is I'd say, software update requires that you enter your password to continue. Or key pass requires your password to continue. Or name anything. You know, one password requires your password to connect to servers to download update. Like anything you want. You can ask them anything you want. And you can give the box any title. We're going to say five. And then here's my command. And it's already been copied to the clipboard for me because, again, lazy. And here's what it, here's what it looks like. Five me. <laughs> yes. I knew you'd come around. Now, when I first did this, you'd run the first, they run the simple dialog command. And you're saying, tell app system preferences to display dialog. I'm asking five your password. Default answer with an icon with a hidden answer and title five and only the OK button. The default button is also OK. 
Now, what will happen is it will bounce down in the dock, and when they see it bouncing, they'll click it and they'll see the dialog. And uh, Mubix reached out to me and he was like, hey, like, how do you get it to like pop it to the front? Because I'm like, you can pop it to the front. That'd be easy. That was not easy because system preferences in particular, you tell it activate, which is supposed to mean pop to the front. And what happens is it pops to the front and then immediately goes to the background. So to the five ground and then back to the background. That's no good. The workaround that I figured out is you tell it to activate twice and then it works. Why? I don't know. Dog science. Uh, oh, oh. That's almost the whole command. Let's try again. Oh, we'll get this. I believe in us. Oh, okay. And then here you have my password. Great. Super success. Now, let's go back to the presentation. I've, I've risked enough. So what happens when you get in, right? That first step, you first drop the shell. You have the shell. Everything's working. What do you do? Normal guy, normal walk. Act natural. Play it cool. Because the last thing you want to do is drop onto a box and then start scanning the network. By the way, if you've never seen this video, it's great. Uh, just search normal guy, normal walk, or going to the grocery store. Really good stuff. And um, the thing that takes YouTube videos and turns them into GIFs is my best friend now. <laughs> so mm. so um, the more you can mimic normalcy, the more you'll learn about the environment, and then the easier it will be to move around and get access to things that you want. So your general strategy is to going to be to instead like find out what there is, but instead of attacking the what, find the person who normally has access to that based on their wiki entries, based on their blog posts, based on their title at the company, and then go after them and then just follow them where you need to go. So how do you figure out where they go and what you might have access to? You drop onto a box, you look at bash history, see where if they SSH to anywhere, because that's going to be an easy way to get in. Uh, you can look at known hosts. Another good trick is PB paste. So I use PB copy to get my script, my OSA script, into my clipboard. PB paste does the opposite. It pastes whatever you have in the clipboard to the command line. And that will work over an SSH session. So what you can do is you pop into their box. What's the last thing in their clipboard? I don't know. Let's find out. PB paste. You know what happens to be sometimes? They're a password. Thanks the way every password manager works by copying things into the clipboard for a little bit. Great. Also, people send passwords to each other. I was on site at an engagement. The one girl asked the other guy, hey, what's the Wi-Fi password again for our private secure one? And he's like, oh, there's strangers here. And he's like, I'll, um, I'll send it to you through the, through the secure chat. She's like, oh, okay. So then, uh, <laughs> I didn't hear you, but I assumed it meant take a drink. <laughs> and uh, what ends up happening is he sends it, and then I get a shell on his box because he needs to print my photo consent form because my photographer just, my photo consent five? Ugh. My five photographer just took a picture of him. And uh, he does that. I get the shell. We PB paste. Guess what's in it? The Wi-Fi password. Thanks. So anyways, curb tickets, good way for lateral movement. There's a lot of information on that. I'm not going to give you any of it. It's out there. Here's something that you may not be familiar with. SSH Control Master. Familiar with this? Anybody? Yes. So anyways, SSH control master is multiplexing for SSH connections into servers. So what happens is I connect, I'm Joe Admin, I connect in, and then I also need to SCP something. I don't get asked for my password because I already have an active connection. It uses my existing session. What this means to me is that if I'm on your box and I see that you just SSH somewhere and this setting's enabled, all I do is type the same command that you typed and I get SSH'd in I don't get prompted for a password. 
I don't get prompted for two-factor authentication. I don't get prompted for anything. This isn't five anything. I'm going to run out of this drink. I better savor it. So after you're in, more spy stuff. You have that new shell in there. Open up a SOX5 proxy on it. SOX5 proxy is my AWS server now. I'm able to browse the internal network. I'm able to browse their internal wiki. I am able to find out things that they now have access to. You want to do the whole recon step again. Network scanning at this point? Nah. And I've already said most of this. You get it. But, but seriously, internal wiki, number one target after you compromise an environment. Because it, it tells all. Everything that they need to know to be an employee there is normally on their wiki. And wikis almost never have two-factor auth. So as soon as you PB paste their password or prompt them for it, five it with OSA script, you, you are on the internal wiki. And man, everything, where the servers are, how to connect to them, how to admin them, perfect. On Linux, this is how I key log. It is the most janky way ever. Uh, there's a command called show key, which echoes out keystrokes back to the terminal. It runs for 10 seconds if there's no activity. So I wrote a Python wrapper for it. It just dumps into a file and cleans it up a little bit. There are definitely better ways to do this. Here's the OSA script stuff we talked about. And then more importantly, this also works with Windows. Uh, I think it was Greg Foss who saw my presentation and was like, that's awesome. I'm going to write a PowerShell version. So now there's a PowerShell version out there. And then right before the last time I gave this talk, uh, Kaz was like, hey, it works on Linux too. Check this command out. Boom, one command, pop-up box, password gets echoed back to the terminal. Great. Look, portability all of a sudden, but not really. OK, so step five. I don't know if you noticed, but every step has been step five after step five. At a certain point, this tactic of following people is not going to work anymore. There's going to be two-factor auth that you can't bypass. There's going to be something that you need to know, and you won't be able to get it from the wiki. So how do you do this? Well, you have to learn everything about the guy that you're targeting. So you take screenshots of his system. Display equals colon zero gives you the screenshot of the user. You can't do the screenshot commands. I was using import. This is for Linux. It exists in OS X and other operating systems as well. Five Linux. Now, there's a, couple, there's a couple caveats we'll talk about. But you might need to go harder than screenshots. You might need to just proxy all of their traffic through a burp plugin that's sitting in AWS, which we did. So they may be RDPing into another box. And they do it from their laptop, and they RDP into their Linux desktop, something like that. So what you can do is, if they're not really using that RDP session, you just freeze the process. The screen doesn't change until they realize that it's frozen and kill it. And then you can RDP while they're there. Now, the thing that sucks is, like, they close their laptop, they go home, like, you lose. So you got to do it while they're there during the day. So lunch break, great. Freeze that process. Go in, do whatever you need to do. Set up everything back the same way it was. And uh, hopefully not get caught. Now, hopefully not get caught. Like, people are going to get suspicious. If you're taking screenshots, if you're SSHing into their box, you're doing all this stuff, if they're admins, they're going to have the know-how to figure it out. So what ends up happening is, um, the first time I did this little screenshot thing, I was smart. I was like, you know what? There's probably a sound that plays every time someone takes a screenshot. So I'm going to go and I'm going to rename that file. And they're not going to hear the sound. Kudos to me. That's exactly what I did. It worked great on the one person that I remembered to do it to. So we're doing this to like five people, trying to figure out who goes where, who has access to the secure environment. And these guys, they're listening to Spotify or whatever, and it's like, chick, chick, chick all day. So, and then they're like, my RDP session's frozen again. Like, yeah. And then they, they look at who's SSH'd and they're like, that's weird that this other admin's SSH'ing into my box. Like, what the F? So they're like, hey, security at company, screenshots are being taken on my computer. I find this highly suspect. 
It's very classy, right? So red team can help. Don't worry. Never mind. My mistake. Sorry. Email to security from that guy because we have access to everything, including his email. And quick, quick side note, email, you pop on an OS Xbox, Linux box, dump cookies, throw those cookies into your browser, you're logged in into their email. Doesn't matter if they have two-factor auth, whatever. So they send this mistake, hey, or we send the mistake for them, I guess. And then we also uh, do a little maintenance on their inbox. Any emails coming back from security, filter. Any emails that say the word screenshot just in case we miss it, filter. <laughs> We're such good helpers. So moving on to step five, get caught. But Fuzzy, I thought you said don't get caught. Well, yeah, don't get caught when you don't want to. However, you should want to at some point. At some point, you're going to get access to everything or you're going to get as far as you can. And you, you should get caught. There's value for the blue team. Five of the blue team, let's kill it. We're done playing the game. No, you can still call me out and I'll just drink air. Uh, if you need to make extra noise to do this, if you're, if you're not stealthy and they're still not detecting you, great. Like, make extra noise. You could do this by network scanning. If there's an IDS device, great. It's probably going to pick up an Nmap scan. Drop a Metasploit interpreter module on a server. Run things against bit not. Like, do whatever it takes to make noise. Do, do those things that, you know, you were like, this is going to get me caught. Do those. See if you get caught. Because if you do those things that you thought would get you caught and you don't get caught, that is a finding. And an important one. Because they have an incident response team, they have a blue team, and suddenly you're like, hey, blue team, why didn't you catch this? And they're like, oh, geez, like, uh, we don't know. So, and you need to find that threshold. You need to find that threshold. And then when you do get caught, something really magical happens. It's, it's my favorite part. Because you get caught, and suddenly the game changes for you. It was all about attacking and penetrating before, and now it's all about persisting. So remember that step, troll ability? This is where that comes in. Because they find your malware, and they figure out your tactic. Great. First thing I do, as soon as, and, and everyone's knee-jerk gut reaction when they find like an intruder in their system is to just start playing whack-a-mole and killing every single thing they can find. Great. My malware's got persistence. It's going to keep coming back until you are able to get to that user's box, figure out what the malware does, figure out how it's persisting, and remove it, or block them off the network. Their mobile use, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. If you've done incident response, it's hard. So we fight for the foothold. My IP address is fluid. I can change it with Twitter. What are you going to do, block Twitter? Maybe. No one's done that yet. It would be good. One time they called Twitter up and got us like the account taken down, so that was good. And, you know, be random. So maybe my normal malware calls out to Twitter, and they look like, okay, who's talking to Twitter, and who has an SSH connection? And logic, that's going to find people with the malware. Well, I know that you've caught me because you're playing whack-a-mole with my shells. So I made a new shell on another system, and it's completely different. Great. Go ahead. Play whack-a-mole. Figure it out. So here's what Blue Team might do, right? You reverse the malware. You got a good team. You reverse the malware. You're like, great. It calls out the Twitter to this IP address. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to block them in real time. Tweak gets made, that's the new C2, we decode it, and we block it. Perfect. Any problem with this? You automatically blocking the IP address that I tweet out? Big problem. Cool, my new IP is this, my new IP is that, my next IP is Google, my next IP is your company's website, my next IP is any resource that you normally access. Ooh, that's not DOS, I'm not doing it, Blue Team's doing it. Yikes. Troll -o 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 -o. So next to last step, I think, uh, step five, is to rampage. Because at this point, you still got that one little extra shell they didn't find. Great. Now's the time to do every risky thing that you didn't do before because you were trying not to get caught. You're caught. You're still in. This is time to like, suck down all the source code, exfil all the databases, do whatever it takes to show them that you stayed in, you win, right? Because you're supposed to look like a badass. Hopefully you don't do this. But if you are able to do this, big finding. They need to change the way they do incident response, maybe. 
But everything needs to come to an end. <sighs> and the last step, when things do come to an end, is to drink and drink. What you should do is you should take blue team out for a drink. If you're red team, you've been making blue team's life hell, right? And red teaming, it's not about making blue team's life hell. It's about testing the security of your organization, right? Or your target organization. So there are people too on the other side, right? It's not red versus blue, it's, well, it's red versus blue. But you're still people, it's people hanging out with people. You have a drink, you get to talk about what went wrong, the stupid things that you messed up. One time I was rolling all my C2s using the like Twitter and the Elastic stuff and they're like, yeah, but you would just copy the Amazon instance and you never changed the certificate that you used for an HTTPS postback. So we just looked for the cert. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> so now I know. And then I'm like, and we did this and you didn't find it. Now they know. And then we're all friends. But they still hate us, but they're more friends at the end. All right. Kaboom! Kaboom! That was necessary, right? <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? No questions? Five me? Back there? Um, so a back connect with Netcat doesn't meet my, uh, the question was, he noticed that I SSH back down into the box instead of just receiving like a reverse shell. Uh, the reason I did it that way is because I wanted to use SSH because it's built in. If I use Netcat, maybe it's on the system, perhaps, but it's not encrypted. So I need an encrypted version of Netcat that's going to be on the system. That isn't on the system by default. So SSH was encrypted, SSH was easy, I could drop the keys and it would work like that. Um, the receiving the reverse shells, there's ways to do it. I'm lazy, this was the easiest way, that's why. Red team don't care. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the question is, have you ever dealt with having to exfil data and it's like regulated data? I assume you mean like things that are extremely sensitive, PII, social security numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yep. Hey, don't get hacked. Uh, the ideal thing is that red team gets signed off in a way that CEO says do what hackers would do. Thank you for that scope because we will do what hackers would do. If you get to take that data, you make the impact. Do they have to disclose it? No. I still technically work for them or I'm employed by them. Yeah, it went to a server. Yeah, we'll fail PCI if they find out about it. But server gets scrubbed, everything gets deleted, shredded. No harm, no foul. Don't get hacked, I guess. Yeah, we don't talk about that, but good question. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yeah, it's my problem. That's why they don't find the data on my thing. That's why, you know, I mean, yeah. If I cared about compliance and regulation, I wouldn't be red teaming. Ugh. You know, I don't, I don't know. You're, you're right, but I guess, I guess it'd be interesting to try and do a red team engagement where you stay like compliant with every law. Kind of an oxymoron, I guess. Any other questions? Great guys, thank you.